Well, all right, uh, Michael, welcome back. Let's stick with this. Uh, oh yeah. Let, let's stick with this for a moment. And okay, we've got the ozone business. Well, that's uh, just the beginning of it. May, may I just uh, one one little thought over this for all the people that are, are listening? And I know you reach a worldwide audience, and I want to say this. I want to lay out, as you're inviting me to do, all of this evidence, and there's a bottom line. We're going to get to it, as you say, later on. We have a unique opportunity in the United States and in this world to make the kind of a difference that is, is critical to our world that nobody's had before, and I'm going to get into that later. First, let me try to satisfy uh, the inquisitive minds and the critical minds. And, you know, that we, we should all be looking at this critically. Here we go. Now, in addition to that connection to A-bomb testing, they also told him that uh, these holes in the ozone were going to allow the penetration of UV and it was going to kill off microorganisms and it would lead to disruptions in the food chain and genetic uh, mutations and other long-term negative effects for humans and the planet. Now, mm -hmm. that's, you know, this is, remember, this is 1975. Well, all right, ozone, this is uh, written by Joel Greenberg, the science editor, uh, at the uh, at the LA Times, and uh, it says ozone hole damages food chain. Now this is 1992, 17 years later. The expanding hole in the ozone layer above the South Pole is significantly reducing the growth of phytoplankton, hmm. minute floating plants that form the foundation of the Antarctic food chain. Researchers reported last week, 17 years after Meyer was told this. The effect is the first direct evidence that the abnormally high levels of ultraviolet light coming through the ozone hole is having an impact on Antarctic populations, said geographer Raymond C. Smith of UC Santa Barbara, who headed the team. And it goes on to just elaborate on this. Okay. Okay. Now, in 1976, one year later, uh, Meyer is told that the extraction of petroleum and natural gas from the Earth as well as the damming of waters and construction of huge cities, were contributing factors to increased earthquake and volcanic activity and to another uh, problem that we would be having. Right? I don't think there's been any proof that cities and so forth contribute to... Well, that's, that's, that's right. I, I'm not going to you know, rest on that earthquakes. one. earthquakes. What I'm going to give you here is this one instead. This is in the Good Life Independent Journal newspaper, which was the week of June 21st to 27th, 1990. Here's the headline. Earthquakes, oil, interact. For four decades, the beach area has been plagued by, unsuccess by unsuccessful threats of onshore and offshore oil drilling and by the knowledge that there are hundreds of substandard buildings which could crumble in a major earthquake. Now, Stanford's geophysics professor, Paul Siegel, has scientifically related both fears. He's published a mathematical model which suggests oil and gas extraction may lead potentially to serious earthquake tremors. Simply stated, Siegel says, when gas or oil that has been sitting in the pores of the rock is taken out, the gas reservoir shrinks. But yes. the, there no, it is. Okay, I've, I've got the idea. Okay, and now, I, I, I don't doubt that perhaps extracting large amounts of oil could cause disruption down low. You know, yes. it sort of makes sense. Well, it does. But, but we're on, what I want from you is, the, you know, I guess that's a sort of a backed up prediction, but big predictions that were made if there were others. Oh, yeah, there, sure there were. Okay, then just give us examples. Okay. And, and you don't have to pull them all up on the computer. Okay, because some of this I, I, I do know by heart, but the newspaper articles... All right, let's to. go to what you know by heart. Okay. Um, in 1975, when Meyer was ostensibly being shown Venus up close and personal in a, in a craft, and we'll t talk about that in a minute. Uh, he was also casually remarking that the mountains down there, there was a mountain that looked to be comparable in height to what he said was the highest mountain on Earth, Mount Everest. At that point, Semyaze, the uh, woman that he is uh, being contacted by and traveling with at this point, says, excuse me, but you're wrong. Uh, Mount Everest is not the highest mountain on Earth. Now, this is a little incidental, but bear with me. This is a 21-year jump. She said, no, no, you don't measure it right. Mount Chimborazo is the highest mountain on your planet because you have to truly measure, since the Earth is elliptical and not perfectly round, measure from the center of the planet, not sea level. Okay, 21 years later, in the 1996 issue of, of Earth magazine, they reported that now scientists have confirmed that Mount Chimborazo is the highest mountain on Earth. But that's a small little thing, 21 years. During that contact, Meyer was given specific information about Venus, 
unknown at the time, which included the composition and percentages of atmospheric gases, the surface temperatures, the depth of the cloud bank. That's with, impressive, and, and all of that... Was uh, corroborated a, a, a year later by both the probes from the U.S. and the USSR. Where did... Uh, stop, slow down. Yeah. Where did Billy write all of this? In these contact reports. See, what happened was, after he would have meetings with these people, yes. he would come home. And remember, now he's a man with one arm. They had modified a standard typewriter for him so that he could type at a very high rate of speed, about 60 words per minute or more with one hand, which basically means with one finger. They had recorded everything, and since he was a child, he had been taught over 1.2 million symbols to recognize symbols telepathically. This is where it gets even more you know, amazing, outrageous, whatever you want to call it. Well... What they would do is transmit back to him the entire conversation, not in English or German, but in symbol form. And while he was translating it in his mind from symbols to German, he was typing it simultaneously, often for hours at a time. Then he would run it off on a Xerox machine and disseminate it to the people that were studying it. It would find its way around Europe. Ultimately, it would be translated into English. Ultimately, Wendell Stevens, who would gather up all this stuff in about 1978 and 79, would publish it in books. And, of course, the books have copyrights in them, and we know when Wendell had this. And so I, on the DVD, I've put the copyright pages. I've scanned in book covers, you know, and I've scanned in some of the original pages from the contact reports and Wendell's pages so people can read this for themselves and they can, you know, now scratch their heads, well, how did he get this stuff in books? All right. This, okay. this information was given to Billy to warn us. Yes, but he, you wanted something really hot. And I do, and if you've got it, get it out there. All right. Let's, let's start with this one. 1978, he's ostensibly taken for a close-up and personal look at Jupiter. He is remarking in the conversation to his, his companion there that, well, Jupiter has rings. I didn't know that. Uh, and he starts talking about Europa. He says that and Europa appears to be covered in ice, and there's the moon Io, which he says to her, I remember you told me that's the most volcanically active body in the solar system. And then he goes on to describe how the rings of Jupiter are primarily formed by the expulsion of matter from the volcanoes on Io. And it's a whole technical long thing we won't go into. I contact the chairman of the astronomy department at Cornell University, Dr. Joseph Viverka, mm -hmm. a year ago in April. And I said to him, Dr. Viverka, you know, I saw your name associated with this, all this information on Jupiter. You know, I know a Swiss guy that published some of this before you did. He <laughs> said, well, that's a little interesting. Send it to me. I said, okay. So I send him the information on, um, on IO and on uh, you know on Europa and stuff, and I get him on the phone one more time, I think, before he freaked out, and I said, did you read the information from Mr. Meyer about Io? And he said, yes, I did, and all I can say is, and this is as close to the quote, and I have the quote on the, on the DVD. Okay. If he said that three to five months before, then all I can say is that he's right. Now... Three to five months before, that's great, except in 1998, Cornell comes out with a new discovery that the rings of Jupiter are formed of dust particles coming off of the moons. Yeah. It's published in 78 by Meyer. So, now... Pretty you, good. Pretty, pretty good. All right. Now we're going to get to the heavy stuff where, if you will, we start talking about the events on this planet and what they already told him that already occurred. All right. Let's do that. Okay. Go ahead. In 19, again in 78, in that same contact, when Wendell Stevens, Lieutenant Colonel Wendell Stevens, U.S. Air Force retired, was at Myers' property, uh, late 78, he was, he wanted to have that information on Jupiter, and Meyer told one of the people to run off a copy for him, and then the phone rings, Meyer runs out of the room without telling that person to not give him the, the predictions for future events there in the same document. They, the person runs off the whole thing. Wendell takes the papers, doesn't look at it, puts it in the briefcase, comes back to the States, starts reading it, and sees that there's specific things mentioned. So, And I'm going to read them to you so you're going to know what they are. All right, so all of a sudden Wendell opens the briefcase and, once he's back in the States, right. and oh, my God, What's here, this? here are the actual predictions Prediction. that Billy did not intend to him, exactly. for him to get it. All so right. before he, what he does next is he calls up another military man, Rudolf Pestalozzi, retired major and Mr. O. Richard Norton, who was the former director of Flandreau Planetarium in Tucson, these guys all read this. 
They sign off on it and they hide it because these are the things that were in there which had not yet occurred. Let's hear it. Jonestown Massacre, 